Thanks everybody for, for joining us. Um, we are going to be talking through the needs of the buyer. And so we have a real brain trust of folks um, and I'm really excited to hear everything that they have to say um, about kind of what districts and, and state level folks need when they're engaging with technologies in, in, in the school district kind of setting and also engaging with, with vendors um, to that effect. Um, so, you know, I'd like to kind of start here with you, Teddy, and just kind of go down and have everyone introduce themselves, um, say where you are, what you do, and, and a little bit about that. Um, so, so, Teddy, do you want to kick us off? Sure. My, my name is Teddy Hartman. I'm the Director of Strategy and Data Privacy for the Howard County School System. Uh, and a little bit of context, Howard County is uh, situated between uh, Washington, D.C. and uh, Baltimore, um, and we have the National Security Administration, NSA, on our eastern uh, side, so Edward Snowden, WikiLeaks uh, fame, and then um, western side gets out to some very kind of folks who are mindful of privacy and want the government out of their lives. So it's kind of a very interesting county and everything in between. <laughs> I'm David Rubin from New Jersey. I'm an attorney. I represent public school districts and private schools throughout our tiny little state, which has, the last count, about 590 separate school districts crammed uh, inside the Garden State. I'm also very active in the National School Boards Association Council of School Attorneys and work with a student data privacy working group for the last few years that's been helping all of us attorneys get up to speed on some of the issues we're talking about here. I'm Jim Siegel. I'm a technology architect for Fairfax County Public Schools. Um, and today I'll be speaking on my own behalf and uh, not representing uh, the views of Fairfax. Fairfax is the 10th largest uh, county in the school district, so like Teddy, we have uh, homeland security lawyers mm -hmm. and lobbyists mm -hmm. uh, uh, as our parents. Good afternoon. Lisa Spencer from Prince George's County Public Schools. I'm the Director for Instructional Technology, and I'm not too far from Howard County, so <laughs> we're neighbors with Teddy. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Whitney Phillips. I'm the Chief Privacy Officer at the Utah State uh, Board of Education. Uh, I'm one of the few uh, SEA level Chief Privacy Officers and I'm happy to be here. Well, we're happy to have all of you. Um, and, and just so, so folks uh, know, my name is Tyler Park. I'm with the Future Privacy Forum and I'm a Policy Council. Um, so I kind of wanted to level set the conversation and, and really start at a high level um, and, and, and kind of ask each of you to talk a little bit about what you think are some of the most challenging overarching privacy issues um, that you guys see on a day to day and then maybe some 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 best best practices or, or some steps that you've you've seen be effective to combat those privacy challenges. Um, so why don't we start with the kind of the district folks and then work up to, to David and Whitney. So the most challenging issues in the in the student privacy space. We're starting with that one. Yeah. Okay. So uh, <laughs> uh, the most challenging issues, uh, I think, any district really faces is getting your arms around the ecosystem um, and how do we think about depending on the size of the school system, how are teachers selecting things, how are principals selecting, how is the school system purchasing, what are we supporting from the central office, who's involved in that vetting process. So we're thinking really specifically about ed tech. I think the biggest thing to think about is really what is that process by which a teacher wants to use something all the way through an approved set, all the implications with parents opting in, opting out. Um, more broadly than the ed tech space, I think there's a lot of work at the enterprise level in privacy that we can address as, as we go. Contracts that aren't technology, MOUs, partnership agreements, there's a whole host of other types of research program evaluation pieces that implicate privacy. Um, but from a purely ed tech perspective, it's that it's that finding that sweet spot between innovation uh, and privacy and how do we balance that as a school system. We want our teachers to be innovative, we want our principals to be innovative, we want our instructional folks to be innovative, but we want to make sure that we're doing all of that while being mindful of, of our obligations to protect privacy. So it's really how do you wrap your arms around that whole big piece uh, when you have 8,000, we have 8,000 teachers, we have 77 school sites, so it's, it's a pretty substantial school system, not quite as big as Prince George's, um, but you know, that, that's our biggest challenge. And along those lines, um, with Prince George's, we are um, larger than Howard. However, we're dealing with the exact same issues, just on a larger scale. Um, as a, di a director for instructional technology, uh, the issue that our challenge is basically working directly with our teachers and our administrators and really educating them on what it is that they need to be mindful of when they're dealing with whether selecting applications or dealing with student data. Who has access to it? What can you do with it? What should you do with it? And what are your responsibilities? 
I think in addition to that, the other challenges are the pace of change that mm. we are experiencing in this area. Um, the the numbers are against this. You're seeing three people here in, in some of the largest districts in the country, um, and we're wildly outnumbered by the numbers of, of our teachers. Mm. And also, the just the multidisciplinary nature of, of this problem. Um, it um, To understand this, you have to have a good understanding of instruction and understanding the value that, that all these tools are bringing, but also of, of technology, of law, of policy, of, of cultural norms of communication. Well, I, I think one difference in the districts I represent from, from these three folks is that we don't have these three folks in New Jersey. <laughs> um, and the biggest challenge that we have is getting folks to have exactly these kinds of discussions. In New Jersey, as I said, we've got just under, we're actually down to just under 600 separate school districts. Uh, for history buffs, that's a little, that's down from over 1,000 school districts in New Jersey about 100 years ago. Um, each of these districts has their own administration, their own school board, their own superintendent. Um, and when people decide to get up in the morning and how they're going to spend their days, they typically spend it on those things that were the stakes are the highest if they screw it up. And, and for better or worse, under the current state of the law, let's be honest, um, the stakes for screwing up student privacy, uh, while there may be moral implications and community relations implications, based on the current state of the law, including the U.S. Supreme Court decision that focused on this some time ago, um, the stakes for getting it wrong are fairly low in terms of monetary liability. Um, fairly low in terms of the U.S. Department of Education ever withholding your, your uh, education funds. That doesn't mean that people shouldn't focus on it, but in terms of where a school superintendent is going to be putting out fires during the day, for better or worse, this tends to be fairly, or at least historically, pretty far down the list. Um, so our job as school attorneys has been to try to get people to change their mindset to focus on these issues. Uh, number one, because it's the right thing to do. Uh, it's, it is legally required whether the legal exposure is high or not. Uh, and at last count, somewhere around 39 states or so uh, have adopted state uh, laws dealing with student privacy that go beyond their federal legislation. And that may well, as time goes by, as they're litigated in the courts, expose school districts to the very sort of liability that could increase the stakes as we go along. So getting these discussions going um, and trying to get people like these three folks to come to New Jersey to educate us is the biggest challenge that we're facing. And I'm not alone. From speaking with my colleagues around the country, um, we're all pretty much in the same boat. What we have here, these you know, we're, we're the districts that have folks with the knowledge of, of law and the, and the tech side of things and the technical aspects of this are, are blessed to have them. Um, we just wish we had more of them. <laughs> uh, well, speaking from a state perspective, this is really loud. Um, I, I think uh, we have understood the challenges of districts and our charter schools. Utah has about 50 districts, about 120 charter schools, and not all of them are able to have folks like you at the district level. And, uh, and so our challenge at the state level is how do we reduce that burden? Um, do we expect uh, all districts uh, and charter school uh, personnel to understand the uh, privacy provisions that are required at the state and federal level to negotiate those with ed tech vendors when um, they maybe aren't as familiar with those requirements as they need to be. They don't have the resources or funds to hire out um, an attorney to negotiate those terms. So I think I think that's our challenge at the state level. How do we do that? Um, how are we able to communicate that message? Uh, also, I think um, some of our um, educators, um, some of the processes on getting ed tech into the classroom, our educators, uh, it's not always clear how they are able to request um, ed tech in the classroom. Uh, there's the perception that if they are free, Mm -hmm. then it's okay to use, uh, which we're all giggling about because we all know um, that that's, that's not necessarily the case. So those are some of the challenges that, that we have at the, the state level. Right, and I think, I think with all of you here, we've gotten a good kind of view of what the, the challenge really is because not only from a district perspective are there a lot of kind of different folks to educate about privacy. And when, when we kind of zoom out to the state level, we're talking about a lot of different districts throughout throughout the states and a lot of different states throughout the country. And then as Jim, Jim said, technology is really, really rapidly changing. 
So I really want to just kind of dive in here and talk about how you've seen kind of approaches to vetting technologies or ed tech apps work um, and how you might go about it kind of from each of your different perspectives. Um, how, how do you know that the technologies that are, that are in schools um, are kind of considering student privacy? Well, I can address it from the school district's point of view. Um, and again, we're, we're, we're chasing after the train trying to catch up with these folks, but um, we are kidding ourselves if we think that, that school districts have the resources in-house to, to do battle, if you will, with the ed vendors who come in you know, from, from uh, with a nationally standardized contract and what have you, with a product that every other school district around them is using. And just like when you want to sign up for something online, you know, you want to try to get past every screen you can to click accept and get it. Many school districts are that way when it comes to buying a product and getting it into the district, is, is where do I sign, get it in here, what's the worst that can happen? Um, and there are, um, I think, as, as Whitney indicated, particularly when it comes to products that are marketed, not even to us, but directly to our staff, where we run into a big problem, and, and particularly in New Jersey, let me just use Classroom Apps as an example, um, marvelous products. Um, you know, they, they, they are, it's the best and brightest teachers who are staying at home at night, uh, their kitchen tables, searching the internet for, for products that are gonna up their game and help them be better. This is not a criticism of them at all. Um, but what happens is, you know, without them thinking through what the implications are, once they click accept for this app that they're gonna put on their phone and walk into school the next day, they've now triggered a host of implications here that um, from just starting with the educational implications of it. Um, you know, a lot of these apps, particularly those that deal with student behavior, um, adopt a certain philosophy that may or may not be the one that your school has adopted and you may be using it in a classroom with nobody up the chain of command being the wiser so there are educational issues as far as whether they're aligned with, with whether they align with what your school district is doing there are procurement issues with that because here you have a completely decent to say it's decentralized procurement is putting it mildly you have in, a, in one of my school districts that has 800 teachers you may have 800 unguided missiles with the best of intentions bringing all of this into their classrooms without anybody having vetted them to make sure that they're okay when they click accept on those terms of service has somebody entered into a contract with somebody and depending on how your state procurement laws are, are drafted it may be with that school district so there are those issues and that's even before you get to the privacy issues because um, you know, whether you're uploading information to the cloud, whether you're using an IEP development software, or uploading data into a behavioral management classroom app, once data is being collected and shared electronically, you know, it ain't going up into any cloud. Uh, you know, there is no cloud, as we say, it's just somebody else's computer. And, and folks don't realize that. So our challenge is to get people that are taking advantage of this marvelous technology to think of student information, not in terms of old fashioned records, but in terms of data that is swirling around, needs to be managed, um, without throwing the baby out with the bathwater and, 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 and foregoing the benefits of this technology. Well, I think that tees up a lot of great issues. And, and Teddy, Jim, and Lisa especially, I want to give you guys kind of a chance to weigh in on that same question of, of how you kind of know what technologies are going into your schools and, and have the chance to vet them. Uh, we do have a centralized um, eye procurement uh, process so as long as the schools are using that and going through that process to purchase applications through software whatever software they want then we have a chance to vet whether or not that's appropriate we vetted both instructionally for pedagogy as well as for the technical in terms of working within our network however as Whitney had noted when teachers identify applications that are free it's automatically assumed that it's approved so if you're purchasing or you're actually accessing applications that are free, we have no way of identifying whether or not it's in use and because teachers have access to their student data, then they can also provide that information to that particular vendor and we are no longer, I mean, we're not, no, we, we don't know. Um, so app information is out there, so which is why it's critical that we truly <coughs> educate our teachers as well as our administrator in, in terms of really being responsible with our student data and making sure that we're mindful of who has access to it. I think you brought up central control for central authentication and that's certainly that's the best practice from both the, the FTC um, in their COPPA facts and it's the it's the best practice uh, from from Department of Ed. There are districts that that do local uh, approval and I think that's 
you know, every district is, is very different. Um, I think the other thing is it's, it's a very different thing. Vetting is a very different thing from approving. Exactly. Um, so it's, it's a much more conscious act. It's either um, exa someone with experience is examining the contract or the terms of service, or in some cases, as we do in my district, an actual technical vetting where you're using the application, you're looking at the application from a security perspective. Um, so there's a number of different ways to vet um, I think um, there are also uh, kind of good examples of whether or not the vetting is done at the, at the individual level. There are also some good consortium models of, uh, uh, for, for vetting, whether they're done by organizations or done by consortiums of districts. Mm -hmm. So for, for me, it's kind of echo and, and build. I, um, at Howard County, we took a, a multi-pronged approach to building our process and, and some policies. So fortunately for us, we had some board members um, who were very privacy minded and actually kind of ran on, the, on a privacy platform to be elected to the school board. Um, so while that may be a kind of single issue you know, for, for some people, it became really a, a point to bring lots of folks together and create a really robust student data privacy policy in the county. And so there was a, a parents' rights policy advocacy cohort that helped kind of drive this really alignment with FERPA and best practices, but we put it in policy, so then that put some teeth behind it. Um, the other thing I've had some success with is really educating folks and talking with curriculum and teachers and really helping to get them to see what I used to kind of, kind of some of us have joked about this, you know, using a, an app or a piece of technology in the classroom is really like a digital field trip. Having been a teacher, I would have never taken my kids on a field trip where I didn't make sure it was safe, it was approved. You know, I taught in LA, there's lots of great places that may have been great to go with kids that would never have been approved or, you know, I uh, went to school in New York. So there's lots of great things we wanna do with kids that might be well-intentioned but need approval. And so helping to frame that mindset of, this is really a digital trip. You're putting your kids out there in the internet, you're putting the kids out there in a cyber world. And we would never endanger kids or knowingly, you know, in a physical world, but yet we we're really quite quick to do it in a digital world for a while. And so getting folks to think about, oh, really, this is a much broader thing. Uh, and to Jim's point earlier, and to other folks too, that kind of cultural component of, do we want to be using this technology? Is this our, 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 our method for thinking about strength finder or strengths and weaknesses or, or behavior or how we want to drive math instruction? So there's a lot of things that I like our school system to think about before they get to the privacy compliance check because there's really, it's how are we using the data? What are we using it for? Is this how we want to be using technology with our students? Uh, and so there's bigger questions and we do have a centralized process. So most everything does come through me at some point um, if it meets those other criteria first. And then, you know, like Jim is saying, we really have a list of approved, not just vetted, but here's the approved mm -hmm. apps. And then here's what that means. Is it an opt-in? Is it an opt-out? Or is it something that we've purchased, in which case there's a contract, our general counsel looks at it, our board approves it. And those are our essential tools where parents don't have the right to opt in and out. So we have kind of have three different buckets once we get to that approval stage uh, in Howard County. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sure. Um, I wanted to talk about a little bit the state perspective on this because it is such a large issue. Um, what Utah has done is we looked at a top-down approach and then a bottom-up approach. So eventually we'll, we'll get it all uh, is, is, is our intention. So uh, we uh, developed uh, for a top-down approach a data privacy agreement that in, uh, incorporates all of the federal and our specific state requirements that a vendor can sign with one uh, district and additional districts can sign just one page and subscribe to that agreement so that yeah. agreements do not have to be negotiated let's see uh, 200 times um, across the state so that's kind of our top-down model that we've piloted the last few months and bottom-up we um, have a requirement that for educator relicensure they need to uh, take the course that we developed and one of those modules is about um, application vetting and letting them know that when they click I agree they're entering into a legally binding contract and do they have that authority so um, that's what we're doing to try to help awesome I, th I, th I think all of you have kind of teed up the, the the issues really well and kind of what you're doing internally but one of one of the other kind of angles that I wanted to take with this panel and one of the things that that I think we could we could communicate is is out to, to folks who work with districts what can they be doing to kind of support support your efforts internally with with privacy and 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 specifically kind of how can ed tech vendors support district efforts to to kind of build privacy into into their districts or or into their states sorry yeah, go ahead, Teddy. Um, so I, I think <clears throat> when I talk to vendors and when I think about ed tech, one of the, the kind of questions I like to raise is, do they know the space they're entering? 
And what I mean by that is a lot of technology folks think that they're entering the space of teaching and learning. We're about personalized learning. You're actually not. You're about public schooling. There's a very different thing, right? I can learn personally from my bigger brother, from my cousin. And if you look through history, lots of people have learned who have never gone to school, right? So the idea that an ed tech vendor is entering the personalized learning space is really, to me, a misnomer. They're entering the space of individualizing public school instruction for students. And the reason why that's important is because public schooling is a very legally bound system of rights and checks and balances and parental rights and school board rights and FERPA and all sorts of laws and IDEA. So the, the space of public schooling is a hugely regulated space with tons of legal and policy frameworks. Teaching and learning happens all the time. My one-year-old learns from his little two-year-old friend who's teaching him how to play a different game, right? That's teaching and learning. Public schooling is what we all do. And so to the vendors, please understand you're coming into a space that is governed by lots of rules. There's, there's school system policies, there's hierarchies of what a teacher should be able to access versus a principal versus a central office person. Um, there's the federal and state. So just to think about really understanding that space is much broader than just I've developed something that may help Teddy learn this thing a little more quickly. Um, that's not the only space they're entering. And so I think that that's kind of my big philosophy lesson for folks is really know that a public schooling is a much bigger space than just teaching and learning. Well, I can certainly support what Teddy is saying. And, and from my perspective, um, you know, there was a time when the, the ed tech industry was new. They were coming with products that people wanted. People at fairly low levels of the food chain were signing with no authority. These things were here. Uh, I think those days are over. And even if um, school districts on average don't have the resources to go toe to toe on a level playing field with the big boys and girls who are marketing these products, I think those days are changing as well. As I indicated, um, just using myself as an example, um, I'm active in a, in a group of 3,000 plus or minus school board lawyers around the country who speak with each other every single day online. And if somebody's trying to blow something past somebody in San Diego, we in New Jersey are going to be hearing about it in about eight nanoseconds. And I think that word needs to be gotten out to our friends in the ad tech industry, not in a, not an adversarial way, but just to let them know you're going to be dealing with us sooner or later. So what you don't want to do is try to market products in a way that are designed to circumvent those of us that are there for purposes of making sure the checks and balances are in place. And please, please, please do not be marketing these products directly to our staff and our teachers in the hope that they will sign on to them on their own, <laughs> again, circumventing us. There's no better way to poison the well. And frankly, from this, I'm not in that business, but just as a businessman myself, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to annoy the folks that are in charge of, of controlling access to the audience that you want um, much easier to deal directly with us and you know uh, just my own personal experience there are instances where ed tech vendors one in particular took that approach and ended up being a win-win situation for everybody so it is possible if people realize that um, look we all want the same thing you've got great products maybe not all of them are great but I mean they're more great than not great we want to take advantage of them we just want to do it in a way that's legally compliant it's to your benefit it's to ours so so you know don't view us as your adversary come deal with us we want to work with you I want to echo on that. So let's assume that we want to buy your product and you want uh, us to, to, you want to sell us the product. Going back to the vetting conversation, the, the most precious resource that we have is time. And very few districts have the, the skill set and the time to do vetting. And the, the way that we have to vet products, um, imagine if you were to buy a used car. And the only tool that you could take to your, to your mechanic, your neighborhood mechanic, was a 13-page contract of legalese that said, do you think this is a good car to buy? That's pretty similar to the situation that the three of us are in, um, uh, and, and actually all of us are in, when we're vetting a, a, a product. One of the biggest uh, uh, emphasis in the last couple of years with all the attention to, to, to privacy has been, oh, the teachers should read the privacy policy be before you consider an app. And, and the unintended consequence of that is you've got a lot of people um, that don't have a, a background in reading kind of very dense legal documents. Um, and a lot of the documents are heavily targeted towards complying with COPPA. So for the last five or six years, the, ma the major takeaway that most of, of, of my colleagues um, have come away with is privacy is something that is important if you're under 13. Um, and then there's this big gap 
um, for, for the rest of our students. Um, so making it easier for us to understand the privacy policies, and, and very specifically, if you look at the, the COPPA FAQ, there's a, a section in there, it's M5, that gives a list of questions that districts should be asking tech vendors. Please, make, make sure that it's easy for us to find the answers to those questions. Definitely. I think that um, it, would, it would help us greatly if the vendors would stop uh, targeting our teachers directly, as well as our principals. We have a number of uh, staff that go out on conferences, um, and they come back, and they decide they want to purchase something, some type of equipment. Thankfully, if the vendor is not a registered or approved vendor within our system, it won't go any further until we actually have to go back and through do the approval process um, for approving the vendor to become an approved vendor within our district. However, the vendors are constantly calling and hounding um, the principals as well as the teachers. And then when they can't get an answer from them because the principals will say, well, it's IT who won't let you, won't let us buy it, then they start to call us. And it's just, it's just, um, a pain. <laughs> it becomes a major issue when they're trying to just sell their product without even understanding exactly what the need is. It's like, are you really serving a need that the district has, or is it just something to just get your product within our school district? Particularly since we're a larger school district, I mean, it's constant. Vendors are constantly hounding our principals as well as our teachers trying to get in the district, so to speak. So quick, quick follow up on that point. How would you, how would you like a vendor to approach you or, or folks in your district, like kind of as a best practice? Uh, for best practices, the, um, if it's a content, specifically for a content, we would much rather they go directly to the content supervisors. It's like, if it's something that really supports the standards and something that the content supervisors would prove in terms of supporting exactly what our teachers are delivering in the classroom, then it should not be an issue. Um, it's when they go to directly to the teacher and expect the teacher to be able to have the authority to be out to actually purchase the tool, which just isn't the way we go. So, uh, and Whitney, I'm wondering if you have kind of other thoughts on this question. I see you kind of writing stuff down over there, so I'm not sure if you wanted to kind of share anything about how vendors can work uh, from, from kind of the state perspective. Sure. Uh, well, to add to what Lisa was discussing, I think vendors could see this as um, an opportunity. Uh, that they can see this as a value add. I know that I receive a lot of uh, questions from districts, charter schools, and from vendors, and um, it would be really helpful if vendors put together one page mm -hmm. on on what they're doing and what they're not doing with student private or student data. Mm -hmm. Something like we do not redisclose personal identifiable information. Uh, we uh, destroy data when we were done with it. We, um, uh, you know, simple things. We do not use our data for targeted advertising where you're being proactive and you're, it's kind of a marketing tool, I think. Yeah, it's, that would be very helpful. I think that would be really helpful. So that's actually a wonderful transition into what I wanted to ask all of you about next. And that's, and that's kind of actually what vendors can and can't do or, can, or should and shouldn't do in terms of their privacy policy in terms of service if, if there are any do's and don'ts there and this is something that's kind of near and dear to my heart um, just because I do a lot of work with the student privacy pledge um, which is kind of which kind of involves going back and forth with vendors on these sorts of, of, of legal documents um, and and I know uh, Jim I don't want to totally put you on the spot but I want to give you the first um, kind of first word on this question of you know what what are some of the do's and don'ts for privacy policies in terms of service for vendors? Uh, so I'll, I'll give two. I don't want to steal from the rest of uh, my, my <laughs> co-panelists. Um, but the ones, and I, 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 all of us read a lot of privacy policies, and the ones that I, I see most often are uh, vendors that put in language that uh, attempts uh, to shift responsibility for compliance with COPPA uh, off onto the district. And then mm -hmm. second to that, the one that I'm seeing more and more crop up is where the, the district is not contracting with the vendor, where there's no relationship with the vendor, but the vendor is deputizing the district as their agent for collecting and in some cases managing and storing and producing on demand the parents' uh, signed permission. Um, 
So those are two mm -hmm. things that I see pretty regularly that are very problematic. And, and I think that, um, and, and I think it was Whitney pointed out that, you, you know, to take a top-down approach, you know, the phrase top-down is not a popular phrase in, in, in a lot of settings, but I think this is an example of an area where because individual school districts typically don't have the resources to reinvent the wheel every time somebody comes in, look, the product is the product. It's, 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 it's marketed by a manufacturer that either has appropriate security protocols in place or they don't. They, they have a contract that either adheres to FERPA or they don't, and presumably it's the same contract being disseminated to every customer they go to. Why shouldn't there be some centralized, perhaps state level, mm -hmm you know, vetting of, not to overuse a word, but, you know, vetting of this stuff so that a school district can see something analogous to a good housekeeping seal of approval, you know, whether it's signing on to the student privacy pledge plus somebody at the state level in the State Education Association having reviewed the contract, the standard contract they have, and given assurances to local districts that it touches all these bases, districts who may not have access to individual legal advice themselves. I think that's really the way to go as a practical matter. We can say things we'd like to see in these contracts, but let's be honest, unless there is some stick behind that, that where people who have the knowledge and the resources uh, to, to actually take the day off and focus on this stuff mm -hmm. that most school districts don't, it's just not going to happen. All right. I, okay. I, guess, I guess I wonder if we're muddying the waters a little bit. Um, <clears throat> we have centralized contracted essential services in Howard County. We're a big enough school system with some purchasing power that we make vendors sign our data sharing agreement. I'd say about 98% of our vendors have signed on to our data sharing agreement. Um, and I know that every school system has a me or a general counsel who's supportive or has maybe the purchasing power of 77,000 students, you know, to say, hey, you want to play in Howard County, you need to abide by um, our rules. Um, so I know we're in, in somewhat um, of, a, of a special circumstance. Um, but that is something I would like to see, you know, vendors be a little more, more open to. Um, I think the other thing that so for those are our contracted essential services. And so I just want to want to make sure that we're talking about the same thing in terms of, are we talking about kind of vetted click agreement type things? We're talking about really those things that we're contracting enterprise wide. Those are a much higher bar for us. Um, and for those, we do make the vendors kind of say that they're willing to be a school official under FERPA and bound by all those rules and they're performing a service for us. And so to, to Jim's point that, you know, no, we're not taking on the, the vendor's COPPA, COPPA you know, um, responsibilities that the vendor wants to come and sign this agreement, they're going to be a school official under, under FERPA for that. Um, but on the on the development side, I know you said, you know, the, the, the product is the product. And to a certain extent, that's that's probably true. But I've always found the vendors a little more easy to work with when they understand you know, that maybe they created a test environment. Maybe there is a, a freemium version that really does not have a lot of data that is used and that it's really something that teachers can go on, they can be innovative, they can play, but there's not really a privacy implication yet. And then if they really like the product, then they can come. So that's always that fine line we're trying to walk is how much do I want to vet this first when a teacher might use it for two minutes and realize, eh, did I really do what I wanted it to do? Thought it did, made Teddy work on it for three hours, and I used it for five minutes in my classroom, and then I'm done. And it's like, well, that was a terrible use of everyone's resources, <laughs> right? That was, a, you know, versus saying, oh, here's this thing. I wanted, I found it at a conference. I'm that great teacher who was up all night, and I found this cool thing. Can I, is there a way to have a safe part of that platform that the teacher can use and go, oh, I can manipulate it. Oh, I can look, I can send some lessons here, put in a few fake student accounts, and then say, oh, this is something I really would like, and then we can work with it. And sometimes, you know, to kind of Jim's end, do I have to buy the car with the contract or can I test drive the car first, right? We need to be able to test drive some of these things um, to see if we even like them. And so that to me, I think, is on, uh, on the vendors to say, hey, in that development stage, can we create certain, certain kind of you know, segmented playgrounds so that we could have these spaces where teachers could play or a central office person can test it out before we have to go through this bigger kind of vetting process. And I think there is some room for vendors to grow in that space, um, especially when they're trying to get to teachers and they're trying to get, because I understand vendors want, want to see that teacher kind of energy behind the product, right? And so I think that there's probably a way they could do that uh, without implicating student privacy if they really kind of thought, you know, thought through fully, you know, how to make that work. Did you say freemium? I did. Oh, I learned a new word today. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Write that down. So I, I, I think we may be coming at this a little bit in, in the reverse order, but, um, but, but, but one of the things I wanted to kind of turn the conversation to was, was the challenge for, for kind of schools and complying with 
FERPA and COPPA, and I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and say the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act mm -hmm. um, and the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which are both federal laws that apply to some degree in schools. Um, and, and, and kind of, you know, I, I think that the district folks we have here, Lisa, Jim, and Teddy, you're all in kind of larger, more sophisticated districts. I wanted to kind of direct this at least at first um, to, to Whitney and to David and to kind of get your perspective on how vendors can help and what other, what other ways there are for schools to kind of address the challenges of complying with FERPA and, and, and COPPA to the extent that they apply to those schools. Um, well, I, I think we've covered some of them. One is, you know, everything comes down to, you know, the fine print uh, in the contract. Every problem that we have here, at least in terms of legal compliance, every, m most of the problems we talked about can be solved through through a properly worded legal contract that's been looked at by somebody who knows what he's looking at. So um, that's, that's job number one, is to make sure, first of all, that those contracts are being seen by people who know what they're looking at. Some districts have those folks, some don't. Um, that goes back to what I said before. Mm -hmm. It would be nice if there was some higher power with the resources behind them who could say, if this company comes into your district uh, using this particular contract, rest assured that somebody at the state level has looked at it and why we can assure you mm -hmm. that it, it meets uh, this that base and that nice. base. That would be wonderful. Um, I think, as I said before, the, the biggest challenge we have is getting folks to take the time to really care about these issues enough to be even asking these questions that we're talking about. I think once, once you get people to focus on the questions, the implications of bad things happening become pretty apparent very quickly, and that sparks a lot of the solutions that we're talking about here. Hmm. Yeah, and, and Whitney, I kind of I, I, I put you on the spot a little bit because I know we've talked in the past, and, and, and Utah has a lot of kind of smaller or more rural districts that might ha not have the benefit of legal counsel or someone else to help them kind of be in compliance with these laws. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the challenges there and what those kind of folks in that situation can do or vendors who are looking to serve those districts can do? Sure. Uh, like many of the other states represented here, we uh, all districts are not very large uh, and uh, they're lucky to have you there. And um, I think sometimes districts or charter schools or even at the state level, we get really siloed into our work and we often don't share what's going on with other uh, organizations because we're just tired and we don't have the time who's got the time but I I would say that leveraging the good work that larger districts are able to do and that capacity that you have and leveraging that and helping those more rural districts and the charter schools uh, because we're all in this together I don't I don't see this is a competition I see this as um, K through 12 education across the state and so in Utah, we have a charter school with five students, and we have a large district of you know 80,000 plus students. And if that large district is able to negotiate those terms, of course they're going to listen. The vendor's going to listen to them, right? Uh, so I think um, negotiating that first and having those other schools piggyback onto that that negotiation is going to be in everyone's best interest. Uh, vendors really like that too. They see. Uh, that there's you know one contract to rule them all and that they're they're not going to have to negotiate this you know many times is really helpful I think teaching and educating and training uh, teachers and administrators because um, we're all in education because of you know not because of the money necessarily but because of uh, wanting to help these students and privacy is important uh, but the instructional relevance I would say is extremely important at the state level and my department doesn't really look at that but LEAs their districts districts and charter schools do so working together with those content area experts as Lisa described is is really important yeah, so, so and, and kind of Lisa, Jim and, Jim and Teddy, kind of in, in, in that context of larger, I, I shouldn't probably say larger, but, uh, but, in, but in your districts and in your experience, I mean, are there things that, that vendors have been able to do or, or, or um, other ways that you've found support for that kind of initial conversation and understanding your obligations with respect to kind of FERPA and COPPA being in the background? I think that as Teddy noted that um, having a, being a larger school district, we do have uh, a lot louder voice and being able to push back on certain things or demand certain expectations or certain performance from the different vendors who want to do business with us. 
I think that we can hold them accountable for making sure that they adhere to our policies, our privacy policies and expectations um, if they want to do business with us. So, um, yeah, that definitely is helpful. I, I think also the, to the point about what are some things that larger, more school systems with some more resources can do. I know, um, I know we have a menu on, on Howard County that's open to the public and anyone kind of see it. And I think, you know, Jim and others have, have done the same. And I had a, a school system who, small school system in a different part of the state. The person called me and said, I'm the, I'm the instructional technology teacher. Now I'm at central office. There's five schools in the, the county and this person's job is now also privacy. And I said, well, here's a link to our menu. He goes, oh good, do you mind if I just copy this? And we may, I'm like, hey, that's on you. But like, sure, if you wanna say this is approved with opt-in or approved with opt-out and you trust Teddy's judgment, that's at least a step better than, you know, nothing or starting from scratch, right? And so I think that, you know, I know, you know, kind of beg, borrow, and steal. When I got started, I was looking to other school systems. And, you know, at the time, Houston was a, was a step ahead of us. And so, you know, kind of that's, I think, how we've all grown in this space is that those uh, those school systems that were early adopters or those states that were early adopters and who kind of got out in the lead, some of us use those resources to catch up. You know, our school system policies or board policies, they're public documents. If any other school system is trying to write a student data privacy policy, you know, ours is pretty easy to find online. And so as at least a model, Model, right, whether you adopt every word is, is is on a different school system, you know, and, and our our um, our privacy agreements. You know, these are all public documents that I think anyone else can pick up. Ours is very closely aligned to the PTAC, you know, terms, you know, best practice. Um, so I think those are some resources that, as those other school systems, um, but for the for the vendors, it really is, you know, thinking through at least in my mind. Um, what their real purpose is and if it is to have these contracts with school systems and they're in a state like Maryland and they've contracted with Howard County and PG and Montgomery County and these big school systems don't try to go bulldoze the smaller ones say look I've had these contracts with these other school systems here you know I've signed on to their terms of service or their or their student data sharing agreement talk to them um, and so I think that there's kind of a, a both end right there's work that every other school system can be doing to borrow from from those of us who are a little farther ahead then there's also vendors who can say hey you know we've done this with some other some of your neighbors you know let's uh, and so I think that there's there's a way for both to happen you, you know Teddy brings up a point that we really haven't discussed but I think is important so far we've been discussing the relationship between the district and the vendors um, you've mentioned how public a lot of this information is mm -hmm. and I think there is a role I think it's appropriate to discuss the relationship between the district and the public in this process as well mm -hmm because um, you know, most people assume, unless they're told otherwise, that student data that's private is being housed in the district and watched over by people who they know and voted for and are paying the salaries of without having any idea that a lot of this information is being uploaded and stored you know, through third party vendors and could be sitting on a server in Bangalore, India for all anybody right. knows. Um, and I think it's important for districts uh, in terms of transparency to make clear to the community um, and hopefully get community buy-in that this is a good thing. Nobody says you have to do this. Um, there are value judgments being made here. I happen to think that the value of this technology far outweighs um, you know, the concerns that are there. But the bottom line is that if folks aren't told what you're doing and perhaps even have the names and identified mm -hmm. who these vendors are publicly, um, number one, you could be accused of you know, not being transparent and, and God forbid that there is a security breach somewhere that's the that is absolutely the worst time for the public to be finding out for the first time that your data has been stored mm -hmm. through some third party vendor exactly. no one knew was there because now you have other community relations issues so getting the public involved early I, I think you mentioned that you know this became such an issue in your district that folks actually ran for the board concerned mm -hmm. about these issues um, it's it's coming so I think to get ahead of that involve the public early on it's the right thing to do and it also is good for community relations because let's be honest most of the time none of this is a problem like a lot of things in my business, until, until it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, you know, if you haven't arranged your affairs to deal with it, it's like trying to hire the fire department after the fire's underway. It's just not gonna work. Yeah, I, I think that's a really, really good point to tee up, and I kinda wanna put a little finer point on it too, which is, which is when do you kind of approach the community with transparency, and when do you approach parents specifically for consent? Uh, I don't. I don't know if those are kind of different things or the same things in your experience. But Jim, I see you. You want to take no, a bite at that apple. I think that's a, it's an essential question, and I think we haven't talked a lot about transparency. It kind of came up in the, in, in, the, in the last point. I think that's that's incredibly important, um, and and they, I think they are kind of two different conversations. Kind of being very transparent about your overall privacy approach, um, and I, I think. One of the things that we've seen over the last six or seven years in, in the privacy space 
um, and, and back then it was a very small group of, of people, um, is that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't take a lot to, to generate a, a lot of, of angst and, and, and uh, panic in, in, in the privacy space. And it, it doesn't actually take a lot of people protesting or objecting to privacy to mm -hmm. significantly derail an initiative. So um, getting out and being transparent, being on message, being very clear um, and not surprising people um, is very important around this. I think, I mean, I, I, I agree. I think, I don't think it's a big ask to be transparent and public on your website about what you're using. I think mm -hmm. in, the, in the earlier presentation, um, uh, Michael from the Department of Education talked about um, what's necessary in terms of consent, in terms of saying what kind of data, who it's going to, and what the purpose is. And, and if you look at the districts that have menus of their applications, they're really answering those three questions. What applications are being used? What's the, what's the purpose? What's the instructional value? And what kind of, of data is being used? Um, I'll, let, I'll let my colleagues <laughs> tackle the, the, the thorny consent, uh, parent consent problem. <laughs> Wow. I think if, if, and I want to remember that we're framing this as, as mm -hmm. needs of the buyer. So if we're thinking about an, you know, an audience of, of ed tech vendors who are creating products, um, it means a whole lot to me at a central office level if an ed tech vendor comes and there's an acknowledgement somewhere in there that if under certain circumstances or contract that that tech vendor would be considered an ed a school official under FERPA, that shows me the vendor understands the landscape and is willing to move out of FTC compliance under the Department of Ed, right? Let's just be clear, no school system is bound by the COPPA. We are not bound by COPPA. We're bound by we're bound by FERPA. And so to Jim's point, Jim's been around on this one for years. Like to these vendors, like stop trying to put your FTC COPPA compliance on school systems. We are not bound. All the FAQ said was that certain circumstances they consider are it's a wonky mess. For me, I want a vendor to say I recognize that I'm going to be a school official under FERPA and bound by that, and then we can, we're a much better starting place. If a vendor is saying, I'm just only bound by COP and I'm never gonna be a school official, A, you're not gonna be an essential service, hmm. you're gonna be in our supplemental list, and then based on the types of information that vendor collects, it's either an opt-in or an opt-out for me. Um, so if it's really just not even full directory, like maybe a nickname or a teacher can create accounts and just put in student nicknames or even kind of create class accounts and there's really not student PII involved, that's an opt out for me. And I know each of us kind of have a difference in art, not a science. If there is actual PII collected, and again, this is that supplemental bucket, so they're not vendors who have come under FERPA, they're not vendors who we're contracting with, these are those teacher directed ones. If they're collecting PII, then we do have an opt-in. So I have, a, I have a standard letter. Teacher can download the letter, say, you know, in addition to the essential services, I'm using whatever for supplemental. And because of the way this vendor is requiring account creation with an email, then a consent. Teacher has to keep that consent. Um, and, and so we have a kind of three, three buckets. And so for, to the vendors, it's really, if you want a central office, big enterprise contract, understand you're gonna be coming under FERPA school official obligations. If you're really trying to stay in the space where you just wanna to try to get around all of that and be just kind of in the teacher space, um, then it's gonna be that opt-in, opt-out, COPPA kind of gray area for some of these things. I mean, we generally do similar, but uh, for the most part, it gets escalated to our accounts, our legal department, and they handle that piece of it, so. <laughs> 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 That's One thing that I, I, I would like to emphasize, uh -huh. as far as what's important for the vendor to understand about consent, is is the biggest difference that you can make in the in, in the benefit for a school is help us avoid consent as much as possible, mm -hmm. and and form that school official relationship. It's 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 maybe six or seven people at the district level involved in negotiating that. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking at individual teachers getting consent for their class, just among the three districts here, I did a rough napkin math, and I think it's 30,000 teachers across the three of us mm -hmm. that would be the labor of teachers getting consent. So it's an enormous order exactly. of magnitude mm -hmm. in terms of the, the impact. When you're and when you're talking teacher effort, you're talking about impact and loss of instructional hours. Right. So that's the thing that you need to understand about, about consent and how it affects the districts. 
I think that's a really good point. Um, and I, I want to actually, I, I kind of know the answer that I think I'm going to get. But but David, you raised the point about kind of click wrap or click share agreements, um, one click agreements. And Jim, I think you you kind of touched on on that a little bit as well in terms of how robust the contact contracting process needs to be. And I was wondering if if kind of what your thoughts are on when those agreements are kind of put in place by by vendors either either going directly to teachers or otherwise i mean i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about kind of the implications of of click wrap click share agreements well it, it's a gray area because it, it a lot of it is is driven by the laws of the particular states on what constitutes a contract and particularly a contract with a public entity or an official representing a public entity um, i mean what i can say generally speaking is that you know once you have teachers at home signing on and clicking I accept uh, they have now entered the twilight zone um, mm -hmm. and uh, at a minimum uh, and you know whether they've entered into a contract with anybody with themselves or the school district um, we may not know until somebody tries to sue because somebody thought somebody breached that contract it just shouldn't be happening um, and and you know my advice to the folks who are willing to listen to me is reroute the discussion so that these discussions are happening at the district level so so teachers aren't put in that position because you know, depending on how those terms of service are written, it may be a different answer with one product than another. Um, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer, other than it's a mess and it's something to be avoided. For us, for for just customers in general, um, in terms of buying products, um, Lord knows what we're clicking and accepting just because we want to get by that screen to get whatever the product is we're looking mm -hmm. for. Just all of us around this table, probably. So who who knows? You know what 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 risk we've all put ourselves at just through the daily life of living in a digital age. But, but here's something we can control. These are folks who work for our districts. We're certainly in a position to say to them, please don't do this. So Whitney, I wanted to actually kind of pull you in on the transparency piece that we were talking through a minute or two ago. And I, we heard a lot of kind of district perspectives of transparency with communities. I was wondering um, if, you, if you kind of have a perspective on that from, from, uh, from the state level, um, you know, how you approach transparency with different communities, whether you do or whether you kind of communicate with districts to do that or how you do that? Sure. Uh, well, we have uh, suggestions or guidance, and then we also have requirements through our uh, state law. And so we like to kind of share both of those. Um, I think, um, first of all, the state law, the Student Data Protection Act, requires that uh, each educational entity, including the SEA, uh, have a collection notice of all of the personally identifiable information collected, uh, both um, the required and the optional, and then um, publicly post that to a website. So. Uh, we have that available every year and we uh, collect com uh, com evidence of compliance of that every year. We also have a requirement uh, to, uh, to publicly post uh, all uh, third party recipients, whether they be vendors or let's say a university conducting uh, a study uh, of any organization that, c that receives personally identifiable information and what that information is, student first name, last name, date of birth, um, and publicly post that as well. And so with all of these different agreements, uh, the public would be able to go on and see by district or charter school what third parties receive, what data elements. Mm -hmm. And so that's a requirement we check on as well. But is it, those are you know, the required pieces. I think there's some other pieces that are not required but are recommended. Um, I look to Colorado in their requirement to publicly post their data sharing agreements. That's not required uh, in Utah. However, I think we found that if you want to improve anything, you start measuring it. Mm -hmm. And if you want to really improve it, you start publicly posting it. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, the quality of these data sharing agreements um, across Colorado significantly improved very, very quickly. Um, and we've, we've improved them in Utah, I would say, but more and more are publicly posting it on their own accord uh, just to be transparent. Also, um, we, we constantly think about privacy, I think, of protecting data when many of the questions I get uh, from parents in particular is, is about access. And you know, I want I want to see what's going on in my students' education records. So I think being transparent about uh, what that process is, what students and parents' rights are, 
what they should expect, what their right to a hearing, um, it, you know, I think that's important too. So in, in kind of thinking through the, the needs of the buyer, the theme of this panel, um, one of the things I, I was really interested in, in kind of having you guys weigh in on just, just as, as perspective um, is we're, we're kind of approaching this, this conversation at a very kind of interesting inflection point in privacy, where, where I think public attitudes and public awareness of it are really kind of shifting and are, and are really, um, you know, people are, are seeing it more and more as an important issue. And we're seeing more and more laws um, especially at the state level that are coming up to address privacy. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about kind of th within your communities, within your districts, with the folks that you work with, uh, you know, inside the districts, outside, um, inside your state, outside, um, Whitney, I, is this something that people are starting to care more about? And is it something that, that is really kind of driving your decision making with, with, with um, not just the technologies in schools, but kind of in, in the priority that you place on, on things like approaching privacy issues, training, um, and, and things like that? It's kind of a broad question, but, I, but I'm interested in your thoughts. Can we start with me? Sure. I have privacy in my title, so I think it's important yeah. in Howard County. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, so I, I, I think um, to the broader question, this is certainly something that is, is, is quite important in Howard County. Um, any contract that implicates student data has to have board approval, whether or not it's above the, the financial threshold, um, $25,000. So I think that that was, in a, in a way, um, a win for privacy because it does make the people who are usually the purchasers, the curriculum folks or the school folks, really have to think through how that data is being used. Is this a product they really want? Are they willing to take it to the board, have that public scrutiny? Um, or is, you know, and if the answer to those questions is all yes, and it's, and there are councils behind the contract and our procurement office and I'm behind it, then it's a real, it's a real easy one for us. We go in full force to the board and even the most reluctant privacy minded um, folks who really don't even like us to be online testing would rather have us pens and pencils um, have a you know have a real hard time kind of uh, pushing back if we're saying no this is curricularly sound we know how the data is being used general counsel's approved it Teddy's approved it procurement's approved it technology's vetted it like that's the kind of level that we've taken this um, to make sure that any time that we are you know to some folks transferring money for data right that that we're using that to the best of our abilities and that that product is, is really sound so we've um, it is an issue. It's an issue that has driven a lot of our decision making, a lot of our uh, work around professional learning, professional development, accountability. Um, and it's, you know, I think one of our, our wins in Howard County is that it's really used to be a strategic move, not a compliance move. Right. So my mantra to folks across the school system is get me involved early rather than late. Don't make me be the no person at the end of a three month process. Get me involved from the outset in the project you're designing. I'll help you think through these data questions from the outset. Um, and then that way we're all in this together moving forward. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the entire discussion we're having has to be viewed in the context of the larger issue of transparency versus confidentiality in general in public life. I mean, going back to the 60s and 70s, you know, when the Freedom of Information Act was passed, and, and in the 70s when a lot of the open government acts were passed throughout the country, um, you know, people were having discussions about, you know, if it's a public entity, the presumption is everything they're doing and every piece of information they have should be public unless there's a real good reason for it not to be. Um, and, you know, FERPA was adopted right in the midst of all of that in the 70s when people were having this national discussion. And I think that, you know, the message that, that I try to impart to districts I work with on this issue, and again, as a lawyer, I'm sensitive to privacy myself. After all, I keep secrets for a living. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when districts talk about where they want to draw the line between what should be private, what should be public, um, you know, the, the point is that also there are value judgments to be made here. I mean, I mean, the fact of the matter is that we don't have to worry about, I mean, just to give you an example, we don't have to worry about the privacy of information if we're not collecting it to begin with. So right off the bat in a state like New Jersey, we have certain information we're required to collect and a whole bunch of other stuff that we can collect if we want. But if we do, it's because somebody decided it was worth collecting and then once we do, it is then private because then there are implications for when we can destroy it afterwards. And I think um, involving your community who after all is gonna be one yelling at you when everything goes wrong, involved initially in helping you with those value judgments on, on what information should be collected to begin with, what should be private, what should be public, um, will in the long run you know, help with the whole discussion we're having into the context of privacy versus transparency generally in, in public life in your community and make sure that it's in step with the community values. 
That makes sense. Um, so we're so we're kind of winding down a little bit. Um, we have a couple more minutes, um, and I wanted to take a little bit of time for each of you to kind of weigh in and and share any advice you might have for either vendors, folks in districts, or folks at this at the state level when they're approaching student privacy and and approaching a kind of a. a either a transaction to get technology into a school or, or, or otherwise. So I was wondering if you had any advice, pearls of wisdom um, to share with the folks out there. You wanna start? Yeah. I think um, I mentioned this before, but to the ed tech vendors to see privacy as an opportunity, um, as a way to sell, set yourself apart from uh, the other vendors, uh, because uh, as you said, there's been a cultural shift uh, we have boards, we have procurement offices, we have a lot of red tape to go through, uh, and privacy is now a part of our processes, hopefully. Uh, and um, if you're able to make you know that process easier, uh, I think privacy can be of really great value. Um, for Prince George's, I would say uh, know who you're dealing with um, and come to the table prepared to comply with the district standards, um, particularly with the issue in terms of whenever we are severing our contract with you, being able to ensure that the deletion, destruction, um, and even the encryption of the data is being adhered to. Um, we've had an issue where we had a, or one of our departments go into a contract with a vendor and that was not specified and so when the contract was severed the data didn't come back to us because that was not a part of the agreement so they ended up and we as well as IT had to get involved in terms of manually retrieving our own data but that was because the agreement was not already up front so um, just making sure that we set that standard up front um, and the, I guess the other thing would be uh, being transparent with whom the third party vendors are or third party partners are and ensuring that if they're having access to our data, making sure that they too are adhering to the uh, data policies that or privacy um, and security of our data is being adhered to. I wanted to revisit a point that, that you had brought up about the challenges that are posed when vendors are marketing directly to teachers yeah. and kind of keep be aware of kind of the organization and the flow of, of how districts approve products and that that certainly understand why that's beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, but but that that does create kind of an inherent adversarial relationship between the people that have to vet and manage policies. Exactly. So there is, I think, there's some happy happy medium there. Um, and then as you're designing products and putting together uh, terms of service and privacy policies, just understand how much time it takes to uh, to vet, um, mm -hmm. even if you do have the time, and understand how uh, how rare that time is, and and uh, make it easy for districts that are vetting products to find the information that we're looking for to vet a product. I think the advice I would give vendors is to get a copy of the recording of this conversation mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and take the time to listen to it because that'll tell you pretty much everything you need to know. Um, not view us as folks to be worked around uh, because you're gonna see us sooner or later. And, and as my colleague here said, you know, we don't wanna be the people saying no at the end of a three month process that people have invested their time in. So um, you know, we're not your partners. Um, we have interests that we need to protect, as do you, but you know you have products that we want often, uh, and we want to find a way to get them in a way that is compliant with the law and with the values of our community. So you know, come see us up front, not, not wait for us to say no at the back end. Uh, yeah, just to, I agree with everything everyone said, um, and, and just to, to maybe take a, a slightly different tack here kind of at the end, um, and to really just be transparent with how the data is being used from a kind of philosophy of privacy perspective, is the data you're collecting and processing, is that really being used to expand student options, to help kids flourish, you know, to help them grow, to see more, or is it being used to limit their options and you know, provide more opportunities for you to market to them, and whether it's the next, the next lesson they can take, the summer camp that you think would align with their skill set. Um, I've seen enough products now to know that there are some whose uses of data may be well intentioned, um, but at the end of the day, kind of from a philosophy perspective, you think about, well, is all that data being used now to present me a few options? Um, 
that maybe based on your data algorithms are great for me, or are we just turning you know ed tech into the next Amazon where I'm being presented with the same set of products I always like to look at because I'm buying the same couple things all the time. And so um, just to really think about how that data is being used and be transparent so that those of us who really do know what we're, we're talking about and what we're thinking about can say, oh, you're collecting these few pieces of data and you're processing it in this way and for this end, now we can make that value judgment, right? Now we can think about does that align with our cultural norms around the data being used with our school system, with our curricular philosophy, or is it just the proverbial black box where you say, we collect these 20 pieces and here's the product at the end? Um, in which case, that becomes kind of a philosophical challenge for some of us who are really steeped in this. Well, I can't say it any better than all of you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I think you've all really hit a, a lot of really good points. I mean, I think education is is a, certainly a highly regulated space. It's a difficult space for um, for vendors and for districts to, to make sure they're kind of marching to the beat that they need to in order to comply with all of the different regulations and laws that they have to adhere to, um, and as well as kind of do the right thing by their by their students and their communities. Um, but if there is any encouragement, I think after this is that we. We've 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 covered what the what the needs are and uh, hopefully identified a path forward um, for for some best excuse me for some best practices for folks to take home. So, thank you each for for all of your time. We really appreciate it. And uh, I don't think we have any audience questions. I'm not seeing any in, in the document here. Mm -hmm. So, we'll wrap and uh, and say thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.